chance and providing this chance to uh, learn about the name entity recognitions from you and we want to learn about the theories and about your experience and your you I have seen we have seen we all have seen your presentation files but we are so excited to learn about uh, this topic and we have the whole team of the uh, AI developers and chatbot and NLP developers here and uh, the, we are. We, if you have no problem, we can. Uh, we want to get the permission to record this uh, interview, so we can publish it in our internal website. There, there will be like uh, four thousand developers in the internal website. That tomorrow they can watch uh, the whole uh, webinar as well. Uh, so, just, I want to say thank you and. Yes, we are at your service. Yeah, so I'm also recording. So I don't think we need two people recording probably, right? Do you want me to record and I can send it to you? Yeah, that would be great because I don't know, like that side, the voice will be clear. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak to you guys. So uh, first of all, I'm just gonna uh, say a few words about myself. Um, so my name is Zhenya Antic. Um, I am originally from Russia, uh, but I live in the U.S. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in computer science from MIT and a PhD in theoretical linguistics from Berkeley. And actually, while I was at Berkeley, I was teaching. So I like this kind of uh, setting, although I haven't done it in a long time. So I'm a little bit nervous. And when I'm nervous, I tend to speak fast. So if I'm too fast, feel free to stop me and ask me questions. Okay? Okay, thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, so after uh, I graduated from Berkeley, I worked for Factset. It's a financial software company in the NLP group. And um, now I have my own consulting business um, in NLP. Um, so I'm going to share my, uh, let's see, my presentation. Can you guys see it? Uh, yes. Yes? Okay, great. So now I'm going to start the presentation. Where is it? Slideshow. Okay, so. So um, just an overview of uh, what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give some definitions. So I, I wasn't sure what uh, you guys know what you don't know. So if the something is basic, I'm sorry if you guys know some things already. I'm sorry that I included it, but um, I wasn't sure what people knew and what people didn't know. Uh, then I'm going to talk about um, extracting named entities such as names, locations, organizations. Uh, extracting concepts such as products and services <laughs> and matching them to a knowledge base. Um, topic modeling. Uh, so putting together similar uh, words and phrases. Relation extraction between entities. Um, I did a little bit on Turkish specific problems and solutions, but I think actually uh, with the modern tools, Turkish is pretty well taken care of, so it's not a big deal. I have some additional notes. I went to a NYC NLP meetup yesterday and there's some interesting, a couple interesting notes that um, came from those talks. So I'm just gonna talk about that as well. And um, I included the references and you guys can go through. They're very detailed, very good references and you can use them in your work um, if you need to. So just a few definitions. Um, information extraction is extracting structured information from unstructured text. So you're including entities and relationships between the entities. And sometimes you also want to connect to an existing knowledge base. And a knowledge base can be any kind of knowledge base. It could be Wikipedia or it could be a, a custom knowledge base, etc. cetera. Um, and NER, named entity recognition, is a subtask of information extraction 
where you are trying to get the names, uh, the locations, the organizations, um, and you might connect them also to an existing knowledge base. Um, similar to NER, NER is concept extraction and linking. Basically, you're extracting entities, but they are not no longer named entities. They're no longer proper names. They're just concepts um, relevant to a particular domain, such as for you guys, banking products and services. So um, let's start with named entity recognition. Um, again, you probably all know this. So you first identify named entities in a sentence, so that, such as this that sentence that I took from some website. Uh, Turkey remembered prolific writer and poet Rifat Ilgaz on July 7th, 26 years since he passed away. So first we want to identify where the na named entities are. Um, and then once we have identified uh, the name entities, we need to classify them. Here we classify them as location, person, and date. And obviously, um, the way we classify them um, differs uh, from domain to a domain. Some domains can use this generic classification, such as location, person, date, organization, etc. But others will probably need other um, classification schemes more detailed or less detailed or others that include other classes, etc. And usually the lab labeling schemes indicate named entity start, named entity end, and a word inside named entity and words outside named ent entities. Um, or you could just say beginning inside and end, uh, sorry, beginning inside and outside, and then uh, you don't really need to identify uh, start and end because if you see an outside tag after a, an inside one, you know that the named entity um, stop. So basically there are uh, two different schemes. One is this one with three labels and the other one with uh, five. Um, and before you do NER, you need to do some pre-processing, which is tokenization. Obviously you need to split into sentences and words. And then you do laminization or grouping together the inflected forms of the same word, uh, such as went and go. And you tag the words with the part, parts of speech, US tagging. Um, so um, obviously for any kind of um, NLP task, for most NLP tasks, I should say, there's going to be three different ways to approach this, right? You have rule-based approaches, you have machine learning approaches, and you have um, deep learning approaches where you don't need to engineer the features. So rule-based approaches apparently still exist for NER. Um, and they are high precision and low recall because uh, they're very exact. Um, and they're, but they're also very labor intensive, obviously. And the person engineering the rules need to have detailed linguistic knowledge of the language. But one useful feature are gazetteers or basically dictionaries um, that can be combined with other techniques such as statistical um, uh, machine learning or deep learning. Um, so statistical machine learning uh, techniques are now basically the most common way of how NER is done. And different ML classifiers can be used such as decision trees or um, SVMs. And the, the standard one, which I saw throughout the literature was conditional random fields, uh, which is a discriminative, discriminative classifier since it learns the boundary between the classes. And the reason why conditional random classifiers are used for NER and similar tasks such as where there's a sequence of, of words or, as, or something else where you need to label a sequence is because you uh, take into account uh, context. So it's uh, best suited for such a task, for a sequence labeling task. So um, you have some links here and there is actually Tur Turkish named entity recognition using CRF. So you guys can take a look at that. Now, um, you can also use clustering for named entity recognition, uh, which is unsupervised, uh, and you just cluster similar entities together. 
And there are several different clustering methods. One of them is k nearest neighbors, where you represent each data point as a vector of features, and all are points in a hyperplane. And then you compute um, uh, this Euclidean distance between points. And then uh, the way a label is assigned to a point is that uh, points closest to that one point uh, uh, give a majority vote on what the class is. And some features that are put in um, as input are part of speech, uh, the actual word, upper or lower case, digits, previous word part of speech, previous word label, etc. Um, so there is a paper on Malay named entity recognition, which uses um, two different clustering methods for first identifying whether it's an entity or a non-entity, and then uh, labeling the entity type. So it uses a fuzzy C clustering, some other kind of um, clustering method for identifying whether it's an entity, and then uh, K nearest neighbors to, um, to, to label the actual type. Um, so the trend, of course, has been lately is to use word embeddings throughout uh, NLP tasks and named entity recognition is not an exception. So basically we represent words as uh, vectors in word embeddings. Um, and they're opt obtained using a neural network that tries to predict words from the words that surround it. Um, and you can easily, I mean, I'm sure you know this, but <coughs> generate embeddings easily um, using a cor an existing corpus uh, with uh, Python libraries. And lots of named entity recognition systems use word embeddings uh, as input features. Here you have a semi-supervised named entity recognition paper on Turkish Twitter data. It's a little different for Twitter data because it's, you know, it's very short um, text, um, they don't have much context, but it's um, relevant nonetheless. Um, and of course, there are deep learning uh, approaches to uh, named entity recognition. Um, and adv advantages of deep learning is that we don't need to engineer the features as we do for statistical machine learning. <coughs> but a disadvantage is that it requires lots of labeled data. And many uh, deep learning methods use word embeddings as input, or at least part of input. And another idea is not to just use word embeddings, but also character level embeddings. So it saves sub -word, word, word information such as uh, roots and prefixes and suffixes, which is important for an agglutinative language such as Turkish. And also such approaches can actually be language independent since you just go character by character. And usually bidirectional long short-term memory networks are used because they take into account long distance context dependencies. And um, the state of the art basically, as far as I understood, is you use character and word embeddings and you feed them into a bidirectional long short-term memory network and then into a conditional random field. So there is a model on using such, uh, there's a paper on using such a model for Russian and the approach is similar because I think Russian and Turkish are similar because they're morphologically rich. Um, so I think that's it on NER. Do you guys have any questions on that? Do we have a question here? No, not, I don't see any hands, so we can proceed. Thank okay, you. sounds good. So concept extraction, um, it's similar, somewhat similar to named entity recognition in the sense that you're extracting entities, but um, it's a little, also a little different. And the three main um, tasks under concept extraction are terminology extraction, where you have a corpus already and you want to find out what kind of terminology is used in this corpus or in a domain. Then you have key phrase extraction, which is you're focusing on a document, what kind of um, terminology is extracted from a document. And then you also want to use topic modeling to cluster related keywords into higher level topics. And then once we extract concepts, 
we want to either connect the extracted entities to a knowledge base, or sometimes we want to extend the knowledge base because we found some new concepts that are not in the knowledge base. So again, it's similar to named entity recognition, but uh, differences are is that capitalization obviously is less useful. And uh, it's more complex because you don't have, um, you ha sometimes you have bigger entities that have more words, uh, such as here, inner planets of the solar system. And actually the whole thing is also an entity, inner planets of the solar system. Um, so how do, uh, first we need to find candidate entities. Um, and the way to do the approaches that are used um, is, ex one is extracting n-grams to a predefined length. And another mm -hmm. is you need to do some kind of um, shallow syntactic parsing and uh, extract noun phrases. Um, and you, of course, need to first uh, do part of speech tagging to find out what are the parts of speech. And then once you find candidate entities, you filter them either using rule-based systems or statistical systems. So for statistical systems, once you uh, want to filter, you analyze two key properties. Um, the first property is um, unithood. So it's uh, uh, how well do the, these words um, stick together, basically. So uh, compare the expected number of times this uh, collocation, such as mean squared error, would appear if the individual words were independent versus the actual number of times a collocation appears. So if the words were independent, it would appear less uh, because mean squared error, what are the chances that those words appear together? But since this is a unit, then it appears more, actually. Or you could also compare web search results for mean squared error in quotes, so just for that term, versus uh, for mean and squared and error. Although I'm not sure how it actually works with Google nowadays. I'm not sure if that actually works, so. But it was reported in one of the papers. And the other uh, key property is termhood, which is relevance to, of the term to the domain in question. And here, TFIDF, term frequency, invert, inverted uh, document frequencies com commonly used. So basically, if the term is frequently used in the document, but infrequently used across all other documents, that means it's uh, relevant to this particular domain. Um, okay, so once we actually extract uh, terms or um, topics from, from the document or domain, we want to uh, sometimes group uh, thematically related terms together, such as things related to cancer, for example, here. Um, and we want to assign topic label to the clusters, potentially coming from our knowledge base or an external knowledge base such as Wikipedia. So for topic modeling, LSA and LDA are the traditional methods, but they um, have some drawbacks, which is uh, they work on individual terms and not multi-word entities. And there are no labels for the topics. Basically, what comes back to you is uh, are clusters, but you have to assign um, the, the name to them. And the words are not semantically interpreted, meaning they're just used as a label um, and not any kind of meaning. There's no meaning in them. So um, there are some other approaches uh, to this. And we could use our knowledge base to basically uh, turn this into a labeling problem. Say, uh, we say, okay, so these are the topics that co come from the knowledge base. How can we label these uh, entities using our knowledge base? Or you could apply LSA and LDA after first linking to the knowledge base. You could also tr uh, use three levels of, instead of two, where you have the words, you have the concepts linked to the knowledge base, and then you have the topic. Excuse me. And then I actually saw a trend to use graph-based approaches um, as a, like an emerging one. They're more, being used more and more, it seems to me. And you calculate centrality as a metric. And I'm not an expert in graphs, so, um, but it looked, looked uh, very interesting. So 
there are a variety of tools in this uh, paper, which is also in the references. It's like a big paper uh, that describes uh, in detail uh, like all these things like named entity recognition and concepts and um, relation uh, extraction. And then it compares all the tools um, uh, on, on how they perform. So may maybe you'll find it useful. So how do we link entities to the knowledge base? Um, usually it's uh, done using graph methods um, and require, it obviously requires a knowledge base that has entities and relations between entities. And again, you could use Wikipedia, which has a whole bunch of entities and relations, or you could use um, like a specific do domain specific um, knowledge base. Okay, um, so how do we actually extract relations between entities? Um, the relations can be binary, such as Barack is married to Michelle, whereas uh, there's only Barack and Michelle, and it could be an airy or more than two, where Cecile gave Mary a book, where we have three entities, Cecile, Mary, and a book. And um, tools that are used for relations extraction, relation extraction Obviously, again, we have the rule-based approaches, which are syntactic parsing and semantic frames, so using those in conjunction or by themselves. And as always, that's, you know, it's kind of moving away and it's kind of becoming a thing of the past. So the other approach is distance supervision, uh, which is based on an idea that if we found two or more entities in a sentence, uh, that also have a known relationship in the knowledge base, then likely they have that relation in that sentence. Which is, I mean, it's a good idea, but it also results in a lot of noisy output. And sometimes you have several relations uh, for a distinct set, set of entities and you don't know which one to pick. Um, and recently, again, we see embeddings appear again and again, and uh, distance supervision uh, has been used with, in conjunction with word embeddings. Uh, and since this is also, uh, could be treated as a sequence problem, where you take a sentence and uh, you say, okay, so we have Barack is married to Michelle. So then we, uh, we say Barack is an argument, is married is a predicate, and Michelle is also an argument. Mm -hmm. So we have the sequence labeling, we, we take the sentence Barack is married to Michelle, and we want to out output a sequence of labels. So um, then again, uh, a bi-directional long short-term memory model is uh, a natural thing uh, to use because this is a sequence labeling problem that also, and also a good thing about uh, bi-directional long term long short term <laughs> memory models is that uh, they take into account long distance dependencies, not just immediate dependencies. And then there is a paper on um, adding in word embeddings, and I think it's used in conjunction with also uh, um, LSTM there. Zahina, may I stop you here because yes. I have some questions? Yes. Can you go back on the slide back? This one? Okay. Yes. Uh, I need more uh, examples how to do... Uh, for example, first of all, you are, we assume that there is a knowledge base. So right. for that, I should train a graph, right? Knowledge base graph. Assuming that I have it. Right. So what you propose is like, okay, if I have a knowledge graph between some entities, I have the relations. Uh, right. So how I'm going to use these to extract entities or am i using the knowledge graph and uh, assuming that i have any or model as well so i i know the entities in the sentence so mm -hmm. are you proposing that i can use this ner to create new relations in the knowledge graph to improve my knowledge graph or you are doing other i'm doing other way around so i have a knowledge graph, given a knowledge graph which i should do it by myself like i cannot do it with the, do i have a method for it you know so I think mostly um, the, the the papers that I read they mostly talk about matching the relations to an existing knowledge graph. Uh, but there you can also do probably relation um, um, discovery, right? Like if you don't have a relation, you can probably propose new relations. 
if they are not in your knowledge uh, base. So um, you're right. So the yeah. question, like when they say, okay, we have the knowledge graph. Normally, they uh, they pin it to the Wikidata knowledge graph. Wikidata. Okay, so, yes, Wikidata. Have you right. seen the knowledge graph? Too? You can you can search some. You can put some queries. Like they have. I right. Think, I think it's it's, it, yeah, do you have a like they have a, a, specific, a specific language so can you can ma make a like, queries, right? Yeah. Uh, so, but the question is if I want to do it like wiki data for banking, because we are, we are in the banking, we, don't, we are not interested right. to all the information in the world, but we are interested to the banking domain specific knowledge graphs. Right. So, one way is okay, I, cr I have a bunch of thousand, thousands of the entities. Right. I start to create the, some random relations between them. Then I or I have some corpus. I read the corpus and create some relations, which is because which is a very difficult task. I know Wikidata. They had a platform. They, they asked people to write about each entities. So then I ha then through the platform they could recognize the they could create the knowledge graph in the uh, back scene. You know what I mean? Like when people were ever writing uh, this, uh, any, like let's say Lionel Messi or Barack Obama, uh, they were writing, pe the people were writing about uh, any paragraph about the, uh, Barack Obama. Then in the back scene, they had the, they were creating this knowledge graph without users knowing that. Then, right. uh, then later on, they, they, they said, no, now I have a knowledge graph. Uh, now I can make some queries to extract uh, uh, new relations or extract the new entities. Am I right, right or am I right? Uh, yes, I think so. I, I don't know much about Wikidata, but they have to have something. If they, of course, they are constructing a graph in the, behind the scenes. Yeah. Uh, but for you guys, I think uh, you would um, you would probably want to either extract a subgraph of wiki data that's only relevant for you or like construct your own i think that's the best right yeah because uh, most of the vocabulary i'm using uh, because of some i don't know i don't want to go to the details but most of the vocabularies i'm using I'm like let's say today i had two uh, let's say 30 per I, I found like one corpus and i, I had 30 person i didn't have the 30 percent in the wiki data right so mm -hmm. I'm losing 30% word, word embeddings, which I should create it myself. So if I'm going to go it for, go for the 30% of the like, vocabulary, so better to do it the whole, like at least I have the whole knowledge myself, right? Then right. I have also, also extra knowledge that I don't need them. Let's say I don't, I'm not interested in the chemistry in the bank. We are interested in the finance and stuff. Right, of course. So uh, the, the one, pro, one approach might be uh, creating knowledge graph, first create a, create a platform, then through the platform going to, to go to create a, a knowledge graph through the platform. It's similar, something like what uh, Wikipedia they already did. Yeah, and I think there are ways to help you. Like, you don't have to do it manually, obviously, all of it, right? You could re extract all kinds of relationships from your corpus, and then you could try to cluster them and see, you know, so uh, use some kind of unsupervised methods first to help you construct the knowledge graph. So, does that make yes. sense? That's, that, yes, thank you. That's what, that's what I was thinking. Like maybe I can do some pseudo labeling and pseudo -la relationship, but at the end of the day, I think the human should uh, check their whole relationships, right? Yes, yes. So first, like do unsupervised and, and uh, suggest to the human and say, see, this is what we discovered. What do you think is good and what is not good, basically? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so then you can do also relation clustering because you know you have similar relations such as is married to or is spouse of are very similar. So um, one approach is you can use semantic sources such as WordNet and FrameNet. Um, the problem with those is that I think they're only English um, and they're very, um, they don't include all relations. Um, 
Uh, or you could also consider sets of entity pairs uh, that each pattern considers. Um, so you could look if entities for the, the relations, relation, the two relations are uh, the, the sets of entities. If they are nearly identical, then the two patterns must be semantically similar. So if you look at is married to, usually it's uh, uh, a person's, two people's names, right? So uh, if you have two people uh, is married to, it could be clustered with is spouse of because they're also two names. Obviously it comes with certain problems because Two people is uh, is married to and is spouse of is not uh, are not all the only two relations that uh, use two people as entities. So, um, okay. So I just you know just as, uh, a few things about Turkish specific problems is that Turkish has high number of morphological forms, and uh, what I didn't know is that Turkish names are also common words uh, usually. Uh, that's very interesting. So I guess that's a problem sometimes for named entity recognition. And it's a free word or a language like Russian. So that's a similarity. And so there are some language independent solutions such as character based embeddings. Um, and also you could use uh, solutions that are similar to other morphologically rich languages such as Russian. And in the references section, I have several papers uh, that are specific to Turkish. Uh, you will see there's a section. Okay, so um, as I said, yesterday I was at an NYC NLP talk and there's some things that are, uh, might be uh, relevant to you guys, I'm not sure, but maybe. So uh, this uh, company, Laxalytics, they did a comparison. Uh, they compared the task of um, classifying, I think, classifying movie sentiment into positive, negative, or neutral. And they compared the training time and the model size and um, the F1 scores uh, between um, SVM and I think maybe SVM with BERT. So BERT is the latest Google language model. And what they achieved <laughs> were the same F1 sc scores with 10 times less training data uh, compared to just pure S SVM. But also it's 10 times more, the, uh, the training time was 10 times more and the model size was 10 times more. But I think it's an important uh, note that uh, that you could use 10 times less training data for the same type of task and achieve the same type of result. Um, and, okay, uh, so actually I have some stuff about BERT here. So it's similar to word embedding, such as word to vec but the difference is that inc it includes context. So uh, the man was accused of robbing a bank and the man went fishing, fishing by the bank of the river. Uh, the word bank in the two sentences will have two different uh, encodings. And they actually have uh, multilingual models uh, that include top, top 100 languages with the largest Wikipedias, which, is, which includes Turkish. And uh, another talk was for conversational AI. So it's for designing um, chat, chatbot dialogue flows. So what they did was they leveraged conversational da data that already exists. So they had uh, scripts of uh, people calling into call centers uh, to help with something like, I think it was with also actually banking products. It was, uh, for instance, people calling and saying, I want my credit uh, line increased or I lost my credit card. And they had, uh, they graphed that data basically. So with each turn being a node and they clustered similar, uh, similar utterances together so that they could show, uh, like, here are the possible ways that this dialogue could go. And it's a huge graph and you can filter it on different, uh, uh, different um, parameters. So you can read about it in the press release um, if you'd like. It was pretty cool. So, okay, so we talked about um, 
uh, actually the main trends basically are statistical learning and neural networks that are main approaches and for knowledge bases, graph-based approaches are the most popular ones. And word-based and character-based embeddings are being used more and more in BERT recently, which takes into account context, basically. And um, NER, basically, uh, the state of the art is word and character embeddings that are fed into a bidirectional long short-term memory network and then into a CRF. Um, so concept extraction is similar to NER, add some sy syntactic parsing for, to identify noun phrases, and extracting relations also um, a bidirectional, like the state of the art is a bidirectional long -term, term memory network with word embeddings. So basically, that's it. Thanks a lot. Let's check if somebody has a question. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, please? No questions? Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, seems there is no other question. I might have some questions later on. I, I might bother you, but uh, later. But thanks a lot for giving us this opportunity. And it was great. Uh, literature review and theory about, uh, and every, I learned a lot about the theories, new theories, and uh, but, uh, especially the last uh, new findings about how they are doing in the, about knowledge graphs and how, uh, how we can work on the, use the knowledge graphs about the relationship extraction. But the whole topic was great. Thanks a lot, Zenia. Maybe okay. one day I can, we can host you here, and we can, be, we can meet you somewhere. Yeah, that'd be great. If you have anything to add? Yeah, I just, uh, wanted, uh, just wanted to say that I have the references section, so I'm going to send it. Who do I send this to? Uh, should I? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. If you please share it with me, then uh, I will share it with the whole team. Sure, yeah, sounds great. Thank you guys for the opportunity. It was... Uh, Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.